So, welcome all again to this uh, video series of MCQs. So, we are going to again start with the 10 MCQs. I am Dr. Ankit, anatomy professor and faculty of anatomy at LNX. Let's start the videos. So, question number one. A male baby is born with Down syndrome, okay, and associated cardiac defects. Apical four chamber view echo shows a complete AV canal defect that includes a primum ASD, okay, and a posterior in, uh, interventricular septal defect, VSD. What embryonic structures normally fuse to close the foramen primum? Okay, so here we need to know the basic uh, embryology or development of heart, the intraatrial septum. Remember, first of all, before entering into the question, here what we actually had is a common atrial chamber, right? Below, we also had that uh, endocardial cushions over here, okay? The septum which starts earlier from the top from the roof is the septum primum SP, okay? Between SP, that is septum primum, and the endocardial cushions, we have this opening over here, and that opening is what is regarded as the foramen primum FP. Now, what happens is that the septum primum from here has to dip down, 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 and finally it has to fuse with the endocardial cushion to close the foramen primum. It not completely separates the two atrial chambers, the right and the left atria, meaning by that just before the septum primum fuses with the endocardial cushion over here, it starts to leave a small gap at the top. It starts to leave a small gap at the top over here. Now that gap is being uh, called as the foramen secundum. But if you come to the question, they asked what structures fuse to close the foramen primum? It is this septum primum dipping down to fuse with endocardial cushion. That is the point over here. And if you look at the options, then option A, B, C, D, then C option says septum primum and the fused endocardial cushions. Hence, option C is our best answer over here. If you look at an image over here, here what you are seeing is this is the septum primum that has fused with the endocardial cushion down over here. Leaving a gap at the top, that is the foramen secundum that actually becomes our foramen ovale, right, through which the blood passes from the right atria to the left atria, right. Here you can see septum primum with its foramen secundum over here. So coming back to the question, the question here, the answer is option number C. Moving to the next one, a 10-year-old girl presents with a smooth round neck mass, the size of a golf ball at the upper third of the anterior border of her right sternocleidomastoid muscle as seen in the photo. The mass does not affect the girl's daily activities. What is the most likely diagnosis? Now, if you look carefully over here, I'm putting a few arrows over here. This is the mass they are referring to. And if you look at the muscle over here, this is the sternocleidomastoid muscle going down. So there is a smooth round mass in front of the sternocleidomastoid which is not affecting the girl's daily activities. This is a peculiar or the typical location of a branchial cyst, right? also known as our the pharyngeal arches or branchial arches cyst. Option number B is our best answer over here. Option number B is the answer. Coming to the other options, the thyroglossal cyst option number A occurs in the midline. It will occur somewhere over here. Thyroglossal cyst, undescended thymus, preauricular cyst, different things, preauricular and frontal auricular. If you look at an image over here, just for confirmation, look at this image and look at the positioning of the cervical or the branchial cyst in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, right? These are all the positions of the branchial cyst, right? Fair enough. Let's move to the next question, the third one. 67 year old comes to the emergency after experiencing two days of red blood in her feces. The given arterial shows a stain of contrast material indicated by the white arrow. Here you have this as the arrow over here at a bleeding diverticulum. What artery gives off direct branches to supply the bleeding portion of the GI tract? Identify which part of the tract it is. So if you look carefully, this is the hip bone over here. This is the hip bone. Right here you can see area of pelvis. Probably it's a bladder over here. And therefore this on the left side is a descending colon, which will continue as a sigmoid colon. Right. So what arteries do supply the descending sigmoid colon? It is a part of hindgut. Do you know the artery of hindgut? The artery of hindgut is inferior mesenteric artery. And what are the branches given off by IMA or the inferior mesenteric artery? Basically, three branches are there. 
to the descending colon you have a left colic artery to the sigmoid colon you have a sigmoid branches and to the upper part of rectum you have the superior rectal artery okay so these are the three major branches of the ima ima is given off from abdominal aorta around the vertebral level of l3 okay so here aorta celiac trunk superior option number d inferior mesenteric artery will be the answer we have to identify the part of the gut then we identify with our knowledge the artery that supplies that part of the gut okay okay if you look at this image here what we are again seeing is this is our inferior mesenteric artery and that is the first branch left colic sigmoid branch is second branch and the third branch is superior rectal branches okay come to the fourth question the given endoscopy of 58 year old with a history of alcoholism arrives vomiting blood hematemesis which of the following surgical venous anastomosis could relieve this patient symptoms of portal hypertension in the short term so they are already saying that patient had history of alcohol hematemesis portal hypertension portal hypertension means increase of pressure in the portal vein right we all know there are two venous system inside our gut one is the portal vein other is a systematic circulation of ibc now portal vein is having increased pressure ibc is normally regarded as having a normal pressure in a short term what you can do is you can anastomose a tributary of portal vein with a tributary of ibc so that the pressure is redistributed you have to redistribute the pressure inside right inside the venous system so take a branch of or take a tributary of portal vein similar size take a tributary of uh, ibc join them anastomose so that the pressure is redistributed that's the whole point now what are the tributaries of portal vein what are the tributaries of ibc is what is our knowledge all about let us see in the options first of all understand the portal vein is carrying all the blood from the gut 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 means core gut where we absorb where we digest the food right so if you look at the option a inferior mesenteric superior mesenteric both are portal vein tributaries now these both over here are pp i am writing portal vein tributaries so there is no point in uh, anastomosing them both have both are uh, having higher pressure left gastric to splenic again both are tributaries of portal vein no point in anastomosing them superior mesenteric to right renal now superior mesenteric is a tributary of portal vein and the renal vein they directly enter into ibc that is the point so option number c looks like the best bet over here but let's check option number d as well right gastric left gastric again both are tributaries of portal vein only so we come to the options answers our option number c understand this now look at this image and try to understand what we are discussing this is the whole venous drainage over here see what happens is look over here this vein is the portal vein try to trace this vein this vein is the portal vein over here i am putting some black lines over here now it is receiving which veins let us highlight them with a sim similar color the portal vein is formed by right it is formed by the splenic vein over here with the superior mesenteric vein the splenic vein on the other hand receives the various gastric veins as well okay portal vein directly has the you know uh, A tributary of having the right and left gastric vein as well. This is the inferior mesenteric vein, though not labeled. Let me label it for you guys. This is the inferior mesenteric vein. It also joins the splenic vein over here. Okay, so this is the inferior mesenteric vein. So they are all forming the portal vein. But now, if you look, if you look at the uh, what we says the IVC over here, this is the location of the inferior vein here. This is obviously the kidneys over here. and you can very well see that how the veins from the kidneys are entering directly into the ibc finally hepatic veins also enter into the ibc okay so this is how you have to take a superior mesenteric vein and anastomose with a renal vein on any side to just redistribute the pressure in the superior mesenteric vein leading to redistribution of pressure in the portal vein okay this is how we have to answer this disruption of the further development of the structures indicated by the x where is the x here is the x could directly affect the formation of which of the following structures this is an embryology question identify what is x x is in the line of the dorsal side of the embryo you can say multiple stalks of x over here 
what are all these these are all what we call them as the somites or they are part of paraxial mesoderm paraxial mesoderm what do they give rise to they give rise to two three things we should know scleroderm the skeleton the dermatome the dermis and the myotome the muscles myotome dermatome scleroderm which skeleton not the complete skeleton but basically the axial skeleton the the we can say the vertebrae the ribs those skeleton dermatome dermis basically of the posterior part of the body myotome major all the muscles except the head and neck muscles because they are coming from the neural crest so this basic idea we should know identify x then let's come to the options over here bones in the hand that is appendicular skeleton what is the scleroderm was forming it was forming the axial skeleton so this is now a is now the answer a skeletal muscles in there most of the muscles are found by this myotome except i told you head and neck muscles so therefore option number b looks like the best bet till now body hair now hairs come from the ectoderm the surface ectoderm so lining of the intestines intestinal lining they come from the endoderm so this is endoderm this is ectoderm this is mesoderm but not paraxial it is lateral plate mesoderm answer is option number b again remember for exams the topic derivatives of various germ layers very important come to sixth question in this case the defect is related due to failure of fusion of what cranium facial processes remember uh, like uh, one or two sessions before if you are uh, seeing all my previous uh, this video series or mcqs we did a question where the lower lip was not fused in the middle we studied over there the formation of the upper lip as well here you can see the upper lip there is a unilateral cleft and if i recall the processes which are forming the upper lip the maxillary process on the lateral side the medial nasal process on the medial side and this is what is known as a unilateral cleft unilateral cleft upper lip unilateral cleft upper lip over here so it is a non fusion of the maxillary with the medial nasal process search for that in the options maxillary and medial nasal process we have option number a over here okay just to recap this is the image we have already done let me come back to the upper lip over here this is the region of the upper lip in the middle we have the medial nasal process the reticular sides we have the maxillary process on both the sides and this is the image over here showing again the unilateral cleft lip that is a bilateral cleft lip this is cleft lip plus cleft palate that's a cleft palate over here and here again to for your recall this image is oblique facial cleft it is due to non fusion of maxillary with the lateral nasal process here the nasal lacrimal duct might be open that could be a hint in the exam right come to the seventh one after moving a heavy equipment at a construction site a 42 year old goes to his family physician with a bulge in the left groin that does not descend into the scrotum okay so after doing some heavy work there is a bulge in the groin that is not going into the scrotum remember that is a very important point the patient reports the bulge becomes more prominent when he is standing up and coughing on examination the doctor places his fingers in the location of the bulge and notes that his finger feels like it can pass into the abdominal cavity so there is a gap given his presentation and history what is the most likely diagnosis so there is a middle aged man who has done, done some hard work physical work and there is a bulge in the groin that is not entering the scrotum that is probably our inguinal hernia and if you think about which type of inguinal hernia it is a direct type of inguinal hernia because direct type of inguinal hernia directly comes through the hasselbeck triangle that does not normally lead into the inguinal canal into the scrotum it is indirect hernia that can easily if it is of long duration can easily go to the scrotal area of males it's a direct inguinal hernia option number a is the best answer we'll support it with some images as well have a look at this this is the inguinal canal over here this is the inguinal canal and and here you have the deep ring over here right and here you have a superficial ring this is the inguinal canal if the hernia if the hernia enters from here that is known as indirect hernia ind indirect hernia then it will pass through the canal and then obviously will go into the scrotum then what we have the site over here where we have this inferior epigastric artery and we also have this rectus abdominis muscle right so between the inferior epigastric artery and the rectus abdominis muscle we have a triangle that is known as hasselbeck's triangle 
and if the hernia comes from here if the hernia comes from here that is the direct hernia so its normal propensity is not to enter into the canal nor has the propensity to enter into the scrotum obviously this is the difference over here have a look at this also this is the image showing us on the other side the rectus abdominis muscle the inferior epigastric artery mind you this also comes as a question it is a branch of external iliac artery external iliac artery and here we have a hasselbeck's triangle denoted and the direct hernia comes from here as already told and if the hernia comes from here that is indirect inguinal hernia now hasselbeck's triangle if you want to see in a cadaver this is the inside of the abdominal wall what i am saying repeating it again that's the inside of the abdominal wall and if you look come down over here right you come down over here you can easily understand that this is the rectus abdominis muscle fine and this is the inferior epigastric artery fine now if i zoom it a bit this is the hasselbeck triangle bounded medially by the lateral border of rectus abdominis laterally by the inferior epigastric artery and this is our hasselbeck triangle over here just to show you the triangle actually is present right eighth question a 48 year old lady had a had been scheduled for a cholecystectomy during the operation the scissors accidentally entered the tissues immediately posterior to that pelvic foramen the surgical field was filled immediately by profuse bleeding which of the following vessel was most likely so here they are asking you actually the topic is epipelvic foramen do you know its boundaries if you know then do you know what lies posterior is there any vessel identify the vessel lying posterior to it that's the whole point well epipelvic foramen or the foramen of winslow is actually just behind the right margin of lesser omentum let us first come to the topic then we'll look at the options if you look over here if you look over here this is the liver over here that is a part of the stomach and here we can understand this is the l dot o lesser omentum so right margin of lesser omentum will be if i do do not with this blue color will be this and right behind the right margin this cavity is the winslow or epiploic foramen what is uh, down over here that is all greater omentum right so this is the epiploic foramen or foramen of winslow so what will be the boundaries of, of epiploic foramen just try to imagine superiorly you can see the liver is lying inferiorly you are seeing that from stomach continue continues into first part of duodenum so inferior we have the first part of duodenum anteriorly what we have is the right margin of lesser omentum it contains portal triad so what lies posteriorly that was the question posteriorly will be a retroperitoneal structure that, that is to uh, to the right of midline and that has to be a vessel which is actually the ivc so therefore if you come back to the options you can very well reach the answer now option number b the inferior vena cava is our answer over here so you should know the boundaries of epiploic foramen where it actually lies this again is a picture which i try to place over here about the stomach and this hole is the lesser omentum epiploic foramen lies just behind the lesser omentum basically the point of epiploic foramen is to connect the cavity in the side or to connect the cavity uh, behind the stomach that is known as the lesser sac with the cavity in front of the stomach and the omentum that is the greater sac that's the whole point right and here you can see the boundaries of epiploic foramen this is the site of epiploic foramen or winslow behind you can see posteriorly ivc that was a question in front you can see this hole is a portal triad this hole is a portal triad okay fair enough ninth question gastric contents exiting a posterior perforation of stomach wall will accumulate in which of the following just previous question we have seen now imagine that the stomach over here and here somehow we had a posterior perforation we had a posterior perforation so the contents will enter into a space behind the stomach and we just studied that the epiploic foramen connects the lesser sac with the greater sac what is the lesser sac it is the cavity behind the stomach behind the stomach now the next question which we are discussing right now they are asking there is a posterior perforation of stomach the contents will accumulate in where they will accumulate in the lesser sac but that is not the option but lesser sac is also known as omental bursa hence you can see option number d over here this is the omental bursa that is the answer the left paracolicutor para paravertebral gutter they are different areas 
okay so for the ninth question the answer is option number d oventil bursa if we look at this image the peritoneal lining over here that's an anterior aspect that's a posterior aspect identify the stomach over here and the cavity behind the stomach if i place some dots over here this hole is what this hole is a lesser sac so if there is a posterior perforation obviously enter way or into lesser sac then why epiploic foramen it might then enter into the greater sac as well okay so remember this where is greater sac this whole dots if i make over here this all is greater sac and behind the stomach that all is lesser sac okay here is one more image same peritoneal lining image but again look at the stomach and the lining behind it look at the lesser sac okay that is the left side that is the right side okay this is what they are referring to lesser sac this is whole is g dot s greater sac and this position over here will be the epiploic foramen that we already have done okay let's move to the 10th question the final question of this uh, particular session you are at a surgery and, and are about to mobilize the second portion of duodenum and the head of pancreas normally that operation is done if you remember the uh, cases of ca pancreas the uh, Whipple's operation, all that which is studied in surgery, we have to mobilize the D2 and the head of pancreas. You note an artery in a vein passing anterior to the unsinate process of pancreas. You should know that we have this pancreas over here. This part is the unsinate process, head, neck, body, and T40. So you notice an artery in a vein running anterior to the unsinate process of pancreas and the third portion of the duodenum. Which vessel are these? So they are asking that there is a vessel running right in front of unsinate process. And it is also running right in front of this third part of duodenum. The artery is running right over it. The veins are running right over it. The veins are also running right over it. Okay, just a second. Yes. Fair enough. So this is the third part of duodenum. What are these vessels? These vessels are basically our superior mesenteric vessels. Okay. Let us see an image as well. We'll have a look at this image. Superior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric artery. Okay, this is the second part duodenum. That is the third part duodenum. This is the unsinate process. That is the head, neck, body, and tail. This is our spleen over here. Also, do remember over here that running at the upper border of the pancreas is the splenic artery. That also is an important point to remember, right? So these are our ten questions. Remember, uh, the questions are uh, obviously important, but more important than the questions that we are discussing is the topic. Okay, that's all. I hope you are enjoying. All the rest.